Well, hi, I'm uh, Steve East. I'm the former engineering manager here at the Thames Barrier. Hello there, I'm Andy Batchelor and I'm the operations manager here at the Thames Barrier. And we've been asked a few questions today that we're going to try and answer, have we not, Andy? We certainly have, and it's good to see the questions coming in, so uh, quite varied, Steve. So let's make the best of it. Okay. Um, first one is, how many people does the barrier protect? The barrier protects 1.42 million people in London. Um, obviously that number varies with the number of visitors, but that's the population that's protected by the Thames Tidal Defences, of which the Thames Barrier is the largest component. There's a lot of value tucked away in that as well. Well, the value of the residential properties that are protected alone comes to £321 billion. So, yeah, a lot of UK PLC infrastructure is in the area that we protect. Yeah, so certainly a lot that we've been doing. It's quite varied questions, which is good to see. And one I know you've been involved in over the years is the surveys that have been carried out on the barrier. Not so much the engineering, but more the river. So the question is, who actually does those? Yeah, the hydrographic surveys mm. are done by the Port of London Authority. Um, they've got a control centre next door, and we obviously have to work very closely with our colleagues at the PLA. They've got the staff, the expertise in the vessels to carry out the surveys on our behalf, which they do a couple of times a year. So I know often people think, does the barrier affect the river? But that's something I suppose we've proven over the years it doesn't, isn't it? Yeah, very little impact. Of course, we've got rock armour bed protection, which really helps the stability of the river bed around the barrier. But uh, yeah, we know we have very little impact. Even though there's some massive water that we move around yeah, at times. There is quite a lot of water, as you know. So uh, let me ask a couple now then. So how future proof is the barrier? And what level of sea level rise can the current system withstand? Cool. Straight in. Oh, no, not easy questions. <laughs> um, well, I suppose the thing is that um, the Thames Barrier um, was future-proofed when it started in as much the design, like any engineering structure, we had to look as to what were we de designing for, what levels and how long was the structure going to last. And then we were sort of looking around about the 2030 time. Yeah. Um, and then what we did is in 2000, we thought 2030 is getting a bit close. So we'll start to develop a plan and look to 2100. And I suppose that was really a good study at its time because it actually, um, when it had taken all the science in of climate change as we now know and sea level rise, it actually said that the original design was really good. And because of the way we'd been maintaining it over the years, the barrier could actually last longer. So the actual plan at the moment is for the barrier to last to 2070. We'll need to do some works, as you know, around the other tidal defences, but that will take account of the expectation and depend on worst case scenarios of possibly a metre sea level rise by the end of the century. Yeah, those designers did a great job. They probably didn't even talk about climate change, but they knew about sea level rise and they factored that into the, their, their design calculations. Yeah, I often say that, you know, you need to cast your mind back because the barrier was designed in the 50s and 60s and sea level rise wasn't in the dictionary. But we had very good records on the Thames and, you know, we drew a good path and thought that's what it's going to look like. So, uh, yeah, I think we do well. Indeed. So, um, in the sense of um, sea level rise we covered, it says here, what's the longest the barrier can stay up before the river will flow over it? We're going into our operations now, Steve. Yeah, we are. Um, well, I'd like to say that will never happen mm -hmm. because the barrier is quite a flexible tool, as you know. And once we've stopped the tide going into central London that would cause the flooding to our capital, and we've got a differential between upstream and downstream, we can over-rotate the large 61 metre gates, and that allows a controlled flow of water up the Thames so we can decrease the time before we get equilibrium and can reopen the barrier. Because we don't leave the barrier closed, we reopen it at the end of every tidal operation. So we don't build up a huge head of water in central London, but we can cope with the incoming tide that would otherwise go into central London. It's a really flexible tool. Lots of hand movements there and getting into the action. I suppose the uh, um, what people may not understand is that there's a large tidal range on the Thames and perhaps it's worth mentioning that of sort of seven metres. So what we actually do, as Steve says, is when we close the barrier, 
we close shortly after low water. So in essence, we create an empty space, don't we, upstream? Yeah, huge reservoir. And so when the barrier shut down here at Woolwich, the tide can come in on the other side, but we've got that empty reservoir. And I think that's where the question's going, is that you know, all the flow from the rainfall can fill that without the risk of causing what we would term as a backdoor flood. We certainly don't want to do that. No, that's a question <laughs> I always get asked. What happens to all the water you hold back? Don't you flood downstream? <laughs> and of course we don't, because mm. the tidal walls, the banks are higher downstream mm. than upstream. And that could have been a solution for London, but the Thames would have disappeared behind huge walls, which obviously you wouldn't want. So the barrier is that clever solution to stop flooding in central London, but not flood anybody downstream. No, that's true, because we say, isn't it, if you didn't have the barrier, it would have been three metres on those walls in central London, and you wouldn't have seen the Thames yep. like we know it today. Well, here's a, a, a question. What do you do when there is no flooding forecast? So I suppose the thing is that the barrier has got to operate as we know, isn't it? And um, as well as operating, it's a bit like your car. You can't just drive your car. Um, you have to take it to the garage. And so the barrier needs extensive maintenance. And I'm telling the engineering manager this, <laughs> but um, you know that was in essence. And what we operate is planned preventive maintenance. So there's, you know, out the window, hopefully you can see the barrier and there's many, many components there. Each part needs checking just as like the brake pads on your car to make sure that when you drive it, when we drive the barrier, it's gonna work. So we are making sure all that maintenance is done, but it's not only the Thames barrier, there's all the associated defences as well and all the walls on the uh, um, sides of the River Thames to make sure they're going to do their job. So no, we are very busy as you, as you know. Uh, and of course a lot of that maintenance is done with our in-house teams, but we also use specialist contractors for certain element, elements of that, those maintenance activities. Yeah, no, I, I think that's worth mentioning as well because we've obviously got a team here you know, which report to you and I, um, and those are sort of engineers, uh, forecasters, all of different uh, disciplines, and it is those people that do the majority of the maintenance, but equally, it's that twin hat approach, I, I call it. They put on the different hat when they come in to operate, but we can't do everything, so we do have to use um, contractors as well yep. to ensure that. Okay, so an interesting one here, Steve. Um, what's a fact about the barrier that might surprise people? Oh, I suppose there are many, but I, one of my favourites is always um, to talk about the large gates. So the 61 metre wide gates, 20 metres high, a lot of steel in there. They weigh 3,300 tonnes each. Mm. And if you want to equate that weight to something people might know, it's roughly about seven supersized jumbo jets fully laden. That's the equivalent weight that we're moving around a single gate in a river that's got a tidal range of seven metres. Easy peasy. And that's only one and we've got 10 of them. Indeed. Bit of a job then. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is, it is uh, an interesting one. Can members of the public visit the barrier? So, the answer is yes, but they can come to our information centre. So, we've got an information centre which um, people are able to go online and book, and then they can have tours of the centre where there's working exhibition and models that show how the barrier operates, um, which are very informative and worth doing. Unfortunately though, um, people aren't allowed on the structure itself. Um, and I suppose that's twofold really, one for security, but secondly, it is an engineering site and it's not really set out for public safely to be able to walk around. But we very much welcome visitors to come down to the information centre. And when the sun's shining, not like today, we've got a public area where mm -hmm. if you want to bring a picnic and sit by the river, why not? Yep, and there's even a place for the kids yep. um, to play area. <laughs> and uh, once a month we have a test closure, so you can also see that in action for couple of hours and actually see the barrier work and they're again publicised on the website. Right, great. So, um, well, have you only had one? What was, what was your most memorable day at the barrier? Well, as you know, I've been here nearly 38 years, so there's been lots of memorable days. Um, and, and you're right, it, you, it's hard to pick out one, but I always get a buzz, I always get a kick when I'm the duty controller and we're in flood defence operational mode and we're protecting London from an incoming tide. Uh, because 99.9% .9 of what we do, as you know, 
it's just preparing for that 0.1% of the time when we're actually operational. Mm. And when you're in the control room, closing the barrier, doing what we're here to do, uh, A, it makes me very proud, and B, you just get that, that real buzz from achieving what it is your work, your career, your colleagues have been striving for. Mm. And um, so I'm not gonna have a single memorable day, but those memorable days when we're operational, that, that's what do it for me. I think I'll build on that actually, because I think, I, I totally agree with you, I think it is when you operate because we're doing our job. I think the memorable one to me, although it was very tough at the time, was back in 2013 and 14, when we, um, if you remember, it didn't stop raining over that winter period. Yep. And we did 50 closures in that 13 weeks. Yeah, we and I think you and well. I were working continual shifts, <laughs> weren't we? But the feeling of closing the barrier that number of times, which for its time, we did in 13 weeks, that the barrier had, you know, a third of which for the 30 years before. So, you know, when you play with numbers, it was a fantastic feat and 20 consecutive ones and you keep going and you think, yes, we did it. So I think there certainly is some memorable times. <laughs> I'm going to qualify my answer because I know eight consecutive night closures, when you do that, it starts to lose its gloss a bit. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so a sort of related question. What's been the hardest, most stressful day you've had here? OK. Um, I suppose, inevitably, things can't go right all the time. Um, we have lots of systems to ensure the reliability of the barrier, safeguards, backups and that. But I suppose, let's just call it outside intervention, should we say, and I suppose for us it was when the sand kite hit. Yeah. So, um, you know, people know, you know, shipping goes through the barrier. This was an aggregate dredger, many thousand tonnes that um, in the fog didn't get through the gap, <laughs> should we say, if I'm being polite, and yep. literally hit us. Um, and then came off and actually dropped its cargo, if you remember, on top of our gate. So I, I think that was more like my worst day at the office, should we say. But in testament, the other way round was, um, you know, we got through it and the systems held up, the barrier was intact, and testament to the design and everything that goes with it. I'm thinking back, it took eight days to refloat mm. the vessel, clear the aggregate, a lot of media interest, a German mm. debate in the House of Commons. It was a fairly busy time, wasn't it? Just slightly. So yeah. I think that qualifies, yeah, as what was it, the most stressful day? Yeah. But, Although, uh, COVID wasn't much fun, was it? Well, that's true. But I think, again, if you look at the team, that's more like, you, you know, notwithstanding the effects of the pandemic, the normality of that, but the fact that, you know, teams were here, in, here day in, day out, yep. maintaining the barriers still so that we could be operational. Yeah. That's a great testament to our teams because they showed a flexibility, adaptability, mm. different ways of working to carry on working safely in terms of COVID precautions, but still make sure the barrier was operational. So yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's well worth remembering. Yeah, and the teams are fantastic in that because they all came with the pride, they left their families at home to literally ensure that we did the job. Yeah. Well, I think we got to the end of the question, so I guess uh, you can go and put your feet up now. Well. There we go. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Andy. <laughs>